Anytime I hear the, anytime I hear the word uh, Jesus teacher, those put together immediately, I think brave and bold. I don't know about you. How many of that come, comes to your mind immediately? Jesus teacher, and then I just the brave and bold always because of that that little hymn that I've known for a very long time. Jesus teacher, brave and bold. You have to be brave to be a teacher. I think we forget that because it's a uh, not an uncommon uh, profession. Lots of we know lots of teachers. And uh, just as an aside, it seemed all the teachers in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia were from Cape Breton. I don't know why that is. My dad has a theory about honoring education in Cape Breton. And so you only sent one kid to the priesthood, you sent one kid to the education. But uh, I, I had a bunch of, just a slew of Cape Breton teachers. And, uh, but it takes bravery, right, to be a teacher. You've got to get up in front of a class full of unruly children or university students or college students or maybe it's a workshop you're leading. And uh, they often say, uh, let's say a preacher, uh, a famous preacher once said, the preacher draws their breath in pain. I think it's a, a quote from Hamlet, actually. The teacher draws, the, the, the preacher draws their breath in pain, meaning it's, it's hard to draw it in and let it out again. And the same, I think, with teaching sometimes. Speaking is not as easy as we think it is. It takes great courage. Jesus, teacher, brave and bold. This is something that we don't often think about teaching, but teachers have to be bold. You can't always speak about what people want to hear when you're a teacher. That was certainly true with my math teacher. She never told me what I wanted to hear. Like you got an 85 on your exam, or you're a marvelous math student, Dave. Sometimes teachers have to be bold and teach something that kids don't like or students don't want to hear or a fact that changes their mindset or their cultural understanding of things. And they go home to their family with these new learnings. All week long I just <clears throat> put teaching into my heart. I'm no expert. I haven't studied educational processes. But I just thought I'd give it a whirl on my own about exactly what teaching is. To teach, in my mind, is to inspire. We would say that. Teachers inspire. They uh, draw up new dreams. They draw out new hopes in their students. And new skills. And inspire them to do better. To teach is to grow. That's an easy one. We would say that. Teaching is about growing. And right on the heels of that is nurture, of course. We don't use the word nurture a lot. Kind of around uh, nurturing plants or nur mothers nurture their children. That's a very nurturing mother, right? We don't use the word nurture in common parlance. But I think it's a good word because it's a deep word, nurture. It's growing with just some extra love involved. So you're growing and nurturing. Teaching is certainly about nurturing little seeds uh, inside of people. Little seeds of knowledge and growing them into bigger knowledge and we always hope someday wisdom, of course. To teach is to shape. Right? We often send our kids to school hoping they'll be shaped. Like they had a long weekend and they're a bit crazy and they're like, well, they'll get shaped back at school. Right? Warren Hayes class. A lot of shaping going on. Yeah. You can see it when Warren's kids come to church, they look terrified, right? They sit, they sit so still. <laughs> I've said to kids in malls, if I met a kid in a mall, I say, hey, do you know what school they Oh, do you know Mr. Hay? They just turn around and go the other way. <laughs> to teach is to shape. To shape what is rough in terms of knowledge, what is ignorance or naivete, and to shape it into something more concrete, something more beautiful, something more understanding, something more uh, known. But even better, to teach, I think, is to open. Teaching is an opening for people. It's a way to fall open to the world. It's a way to connect in new ways. It's a way to stop being closed and tight in what we thought we knew and falling open and becoming open to more. We go from this to more when we are taught. And teaching 
at its deepest in my mind, is about bringing close and making intimate that which had been far away. Do you see that? Teaching is about bringing close and making intimate. It's that process of using words and language to help people understand something they didn't understand before and in language that makes it intimate in their lives. It lights them on fire, we would say. It creates a spark that excites. Every single one of you learns something that lit you on fire. Not, it's not necessarily something you're even good at. It might be even something you learned later on in life. Maybe it's a, a love for creation. Or maybe it's a, a, who loves animals? Who was taught by a teacher about animals that just lit you on fire? No animal lovers yet. Thank you, Kate, doctor of veterinary science, healer of pelvises on the... Penny loves animals. How many of you can remember a moment where you learned something and you were so excited about what you learned? Oh, man. <laughs> I am, I, I am, you, you can usually sleep through the sermon, but you're not getting a pass this time. I'm going to send you all back to school. You all need to do, where's Ellen? Is Ellen here today? Ellen Marichal is always going back to school and learning. How many of you have taken college, audited college uh, courses or gone to college for for uh, mature students or anything like that. Any of you been in the class at yeah, Cornell? Yeah. It's a lot of fun. More of you need to do that, apparently, because you haven't, you don't remember anything that excited you. I remember falling in love with the music of Gabrielli. Giovanni Gabrielli. I remember falling in love with the way that he wrote music. The way that every single instrument had a part to play. And they'd play and another one would answer back and forth like this. It lit me on fire. I remember how exciting that was. And there are many more. I just watch Planet Earth. I get excited. I don't know about you. And there's a two. There's number two is out now, right? Oh. David Attenborough is a great teacher. He draws you in and makes you feel like your understanding is more intimate and closer to your life than it was before. Educators of all kinds bring something of the world and bring it close to the student. They help a student find a path into something that will inform their lives in a small way or in a large way. The fancy term for the practice or process of teaching is pedagogy. That's not a word we use a lot, pedagogy. But it comes from the Greek, pedagogos. You all knew that. Which is at its root, servant leader. A servant who leads, or a slave actually, a, a slave who leads. And the Pythagogos was the person who the family, rich families in the empire, Greek empire, entrusted their kids to these servants who would bring knowledge. My uh, New Testament professor called them a go-between, the school bus driver, the back and forth, the person who brought the kids from what they used to know into new knowledge. Back and forth, that there's a linking in the servant leader, the pedagogos, pedagog. I like that go between every educator and those who support them, and there are many people who support our educators. They're all part of God's work in the world by exciting, opening, and nourishing wonder, and helping with a deeper connecting to this marvelous world of ours that God gave us. To enjoy. We would know very little if it wasn't for our educators. Jesus did this really well. He was a great teacher. He did it through parable. How many, how many of you have a favorite parable? Favorite parables? Anybody got them? I won't ask you to tell the parable. Got a favorite parable? Okay, Philip, what's your favorite parable? <laughs> no, you don't have to tell it, just the name of it. You had one. Anybody else? Kathy? The sower, the sower of the seed. A great extended metaphor, right? Francine, do you have a favorite parable? Consider the lilies. That's a teaching, not a parable, but that's great. Jesus was also great with metaphors. I was coming to that, where you take an image that is close to people's real lives, like lilies, like sowing, 
a field, like a city on a hill cannot be hid. Right? A lamp, no one lights a lampstand, Jesus. No one lights a lamp, puts it underneath a bushel basket. These are real images for us. We are salt. We are light. There was a parable. I had pictures of parables up there a minute ago. The Good Samaritan. There's some really easy to get ones. Can't go wrong with the Good Samaritan. Easy to understand. The Prodigal Son. Can't go wrong with that one. You totally understand that one. And then there were parables you told that were a little more tricky. And then there's parables you told that were so counterculture. They make you lean in and go, what? Or you almost want to turn away. You know, there's some parables where are like, yeah, we really want to hear Jesus, what God wants from us. And then you hear the parable go, okay, no, we don't want to hear what God has for us. Like the workers in the field. The ones who got paid late for one hour's work, the same as the eight-hour workers. Oh, that's a tough one still today. Jesus used parable, metaphor, and sometimes some pretty straight talk. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. What don't you understand? You can hear Jesus saying that afterwards. And those weren't easy lessons. And they were so difficult, he just he didn't put it in parable, he just said it straight up to the disciples. He up on a hill, he took them far away. And he said, Look, guys, I got something to tell you. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who suffer for my name. That's tough to swallow. But it's pretty straight. If someone takes, asks for your shirt, give them your cloak as well. If someone asks you to walk one mile, walk, walk ten. Someone hits you on one cheek, turn the other. These are tough lessons. Jesus, straight out. You heard what I said. Remember that book, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? Remember? What is wrong with you people? Have, have you all been living on the same planet as me? I, some of you got more than 47 years in you. I expect you should remember some things, like school. Or famous books. All I really need to know is, I learned to kid. I've even read to you from that book. Let's see a show of hands now. Everybody remember All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten by Robert Fulgham? Right? It was just a quick 10 point list of stuff that you learned basic in kindergarten, like wash your hands and flush and share cookies, right? And say thank you. I've often wondered what if we wrote a book, everything I really need to know I learned from Jesus. Some people put some lists together on Google if you want to find it. What would that look like? Would we be ready? If somebody said, give me 10 great lessons from Jesus, could you do it? Have you been listening? Has it become intimate for you? Has it helped you fall open the teachings of Jesus? Often the best teachers are quotable, but you know what? I think, I was thinking about this last thing. More of us quote Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr., or Lady Gaga. Oh, she's got stuff to teach us. More than we quote Jesus. Why don't we quote Jesus? Oh, we'll look fancy. We'll look holier than thou. Nothing Jesus said is holier than thou. It's pretty straight up real life stuff. Try that out next time you're in line up at the Safeway or something. Consider the lilies. Francine, somebody's in front of you in line. They sound worried. The, the teller looks concerned about something. Say, hey, consider the lilies. They neither soil nor they toil. And you look how beautiful God made them. For sure, God is going to make us wonderful. God is going to provide for us. You could lay that out on somebody at the safe, right? Right? Why not? You know what they're going to do. Oh. They're going to consider the lilies next time. They, you're right. Or the lesson of the Good Samaritan. Or the lesson, here's one the church always needs, the lesson of the prodigal son who went off and did awful things and his, and his father just welcomed him back with a robe and a ring and a party after all those years of living in hell. The prodigal son, why don't we tell that story to each other? Why don't we quote Jesus, not to hold it over people, but to inspire, to open, to create wonder and to guide us. I actually think that in some ways, don't hold me to this forever, but I think today I'm going to say this. It's more important for us to see Jesus as teacher than it is as Christ and Savior. And you know why? Because kind of Christ, saying Jesus, Christ and Savior, is so easy for us to put Jesus so far away and not listen and think, well, Jesus can do that because he's the Christ and Savior, right? But if we treated Jesus like others treat the Buddha or people treat Muhammad, if we treated Jesus like the great, significant, 
teacher that he was for the history of humankind. If we actually leaned in with our teachable spirits way open and we listen to what he has to say. You know, take one parable, work on it for five years. Listen to what he has to say. I think a whole bunch of stuff will change. Jesus as teacher has been forgotten. We need to become brave and bold in our listening, in our willingness to learn. And on this Baptism Sunday, what a great day for Teaching Sunday. It's important for us to imagine what place we have in learning from Jesus, but also in teaching Jesus and his teachings to these young people we baptize. And Ananias is ready. Like that kid is ready for teaching, right? Listen to the great answers he's got. He's ready to pound nails. He's ready to learn. We can start right now. We can whisper beautiful things into Ava's ear as she goes to sleep at night. At night. We can sing the teachings of Jesus to her through him and song or prayer. What place do we have in meeting Jesus the teacher in our lives? Let's go back to school. Let's listen to the great teacher. Let's listen to the great teacher. And let us grow, fall open, and yearn yet again. Amen. Okay. Now my crazy idea comes to fruition. I like all those of you who have worked in the education system or do work in the education system or at universities or at colleges or in other types of teaching and all those of you who have helped support the school systems or the universities through cleaning or administration or secretary, whatever, I want you all to come up front. And if you brought a symbol, come on up. Yeah, come on up. I'm speaking to you. Come on, Dennis. Great principal. We even heard a beautiful word from Bill Bender this week about thank you for, for honoring the teachers. Come on up. It's a, it's a great thing. Come on up. Oh, look. Norman brought his keys and his broom. The great cleaners of schools. That's very, look at all these people. Holy moly. Wow. Coaches. Yeah, there's coaches too. There we go. <laughs> and piano teacher, and piano teachers, music teachers. Who do we got up here? Where's Dorothy? Is she up here? Come on, Dorothy, you taught piano. Get up here. I know you did. Pleasant Hill School, if I remember correctly. Here comes Jerry. I want to. Now, who else brought a symbol from, from teaching? You got your tattoo, teach with an apple on it. <laughs> Got your what's this? Oh, you got your Apple pin from teaching that what Jerry's got his Fanshawe College uh, Applied Arts. Nice. What else, sir? Oh, a bronze apple. Put that right there. Nice. That apple's been around a while. And uh, and this was oh the Board of Education of the City of London. Right on. Nice, Jerry. First, I want us to uh, any other symbols? The broom. I would like. How many of you are wearing what you wear to school? Great. You wore a tie, though, right, Jerry? Did you wear a tie as well? Yeah. Good. Good. Warren, is that what you wear to school? Sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to take a moment and have us appreciate all the collective wisdom and knowledge and uh, all the journey that's represented here. So let's thank them. Now we're going to, as a community, ask for God's continued blessing on these people. God, we give you great thanks for these people who have supported a sense of wonder in your world, a sense of growing, a sense of learning, a sense of inspiration. We thank you for their bravery and for their boldness. We thank you for the love and the patience they've shown over and over again. We thank you for all the ways that they've supported young people, middle-agers and seniors in learning new things and in coming closer to your wondrous world. So we ask this day, God, that you continue to bless them in their lives, 
and those who continue to work for education, that you would bless them with renewed strength, renewed courage, renewed patience, and continue to teach them so that they may be inspired by your great word and by your love. Amen. Thank you very much. Let's sing.